And good evening once again. Welcome to Portland Bible Church, our church in exile up here in Vancouver, Washington at the Glenny Ranch. We're here at our house and you're certainly welcome to come and join with us and uh, we can get you the address if you need it. It's at the website. Uh, also at the website, we have our times on Thursday night, seven o'clock right now. After our class this evening, we have our prayer meeting, and so you can uh, send your prayer requests or praises to us, and we'll be sure to pray for them. <clears throat> Thank the Lord for your uh, praises if you have any. And also on Sunday, we have our class at 10 o'clock in the morning, uh, and then 11.15. We take a little break in between the classes. We have some goodies that the folks bring. So if you join with us, you'll get those special treats. Uh, and then after class, we have the second session at 11.15. And following that, uh, we have uh, the time for singing the great hymns of the church. We have about a half hour of singing, and it's just a real good time of fellowship. So hopefully some of you can join with us for that. That'd be great. And also if the ladies have an opportunity, on Wednesday at 2 o'clock, Judy has a ladies' Bible study right here in our house, so you can join with her. It is not posted as of yet. We haven't gotten to that yet. Uh, it's on uh, 1 John 1 9, is what she's doing currently. Uh, well, 1 John, but 1 John 1 9 is part of that. And so that's what she's working on. I think you just went over that again the other day. So 1 John 1 9, important for believers. And so uh, we always take a moment or two at the beginning of each of our classes for that function. Uh, to make sure that we're filled with the Spirit. As believers, we, we recognize that we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, uh, and we never lose that. We get that at the moment of salvation. It's part of the pa package of being baptized, entered into union with Christ that we get, the indwelling. But the filling is subsequent, and if we commit any sins as a believer, and we do, Paul tells us that, John tells us that, if we say we have no sin, we make God a liar, and therefore, as believers, we do commit sin. And the way it's handled, of course, is 1 John 1, 9 and other passages that tell us that if we as believers confess our sins, that means to name, to cite, to agree with God, to tell God about a particular sin that the Holy Spirit has brought to your remembrance and you acknowledge it and confess it to the Father as sin. If we do that, he, God the Father, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, which picks up anything that we either forgot or didn't know about at all. We call them sometimes the unknown or forgotten sins, and they are also forgiven on the same basis. Christ died for all sins on the cross, so it's a retroactive operation where we're looking backward to the cross and basically thanking Jesus Christ for dying and paying for those sins. And by so doing, each time we confess our sins, we acknowledge his finished work on the cross and are reinstated to fellowship and the filling of the Spirit. So with that in mind, and in preparation for our study this evening, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your plan, your magnificent plan of grace that provides for us the marvelous salvation through your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for your word that lives and abides forever and is the very substance of everything we need to understand in this life to function and by way of preparation for our eternal destiny with your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for this time that we have, that uh, we can study the things of your word and uh, enable our hearts to be encouraged, lifted up, challenged, motivated, all of those things. And we recognize that at this time we have great adversity surrounding us, seemingly on every side. Nevertheless, in your word and in your local church, we have a place of repose, a place of re rest, a place of refreshment. And so this is a time where we are in sometimes what I call a free zone. We're free from all the attacks from outside and therefore enjoy the word of God. Let it wash over our person, our soul, and enable and encourage us. Father, help it to help that word to do that as we study this evening. And we pray all these things in Christ's matchless name. Amen. Open, if you will, to uh, Matthew chapter 28, just for a moment. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Remember that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. God has said, fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will help you. I will uphold you uh, with the right hand of my righteousness. Thou will keep him, that is God, in perfect peace, 
whose mind is stayed on thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Study to show yourself approved unto God, workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. In Matthew chapter 28, we have uh, what is called the Great Commission. When I was traveling and my wife met my wife in Campus Crusade for Christ, and we were part of the team of athletes in action presenting the gospel using weightlifting as kind of our vehicle to reach into the schools, which we could do in those days and present the claims of Christ. And of course, part of it is the fact that uh, we believe that in this dispensation, we are to make disciples, not only of individuals, but of all nations. And everywhere you go as a believer, you are an evangelist. You bring the claim of Jesus Christ. And in this passage, we see the Great Commission, which is what Campus Crusade and other evangelical organizations purport to be evangelic arms of the local church. But all of them must stem from the local church, be supported by the local churches, and therefore the local church is the main vehicle for evangelism, even though other organizations have sprouted up, some of them good, some of them not so good. But to the extent that they give a clear presentation of the gospel, they fulfill the Great Commission. The Great Commission, stated here in verse 19, as Jesus is telling his disciples, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We won't get into the baptism there because that's a water baptism that is an identification. It's a public testimony of the spirit baptism that occurs at the moment of salvation. But basically, to make disciples, these are learners. They are students. You might have an individual that you disciple. Uh, as a pastor, you have many that you're discipling because each of us in a local church is a student, a learner. And therefore, even pastors are students and learners. We're students all of our life. We learn from the Lord. We learn many times from a mentor, someone who has discipled us. Ultimately, the Lord becomes the mentor to pastors, and they likewise mentor and disciple those in their congregation. But that doesn't excuse members of the congregation, because you have the opportunity likewise to disciple and mentor others. In fact, that's the whole essence of the New Testament. Uh, Paul tells Timothy, Timothy and others that you need to give faithful men. Of course, the implication is also ladies, but primarily he's addressing the gift of pastor teachers to train faithful men so that they can train others, so that they can train others. And so the replication factor is essential in Christendom. And it's all about first getting the gospel clear, having people believe the gospel, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ because of his death on the cross, providing their so great salvation and eternal life, and then training them in the word of God. We are to study to show ourselves approved unto God, workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, accurately handling the word of truth. So this idea of discipling then has to do with uh, teaching, teaching others. And then the next verse says just that, teaching. So discipling has to do with teaching. There's more than that. There's setting the example for your disciples and so forth, spending time with them, building a relationship, but then teaching. And teaching, of course, is the word in Greek, didaskalos, or the verb uh, uh, didasko, which means to teach, to explain to them, to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The end of the age here, he's addressing the people in the book of Matthews, basically Hebrew believers, and he's looking at the end of the age of Israel, and we've discussed that under our dispensational teaching in previous classes. But as far as we're concerned here, as long as we're in the dispensation of the church, we are to disciple, and we are to teach, and to train. In that vein, of course, we are looking at what I call the study of leadership, and so we've got a, a number of things that we're looking at, particularly in this first section. Uh, we're looking at the, the Old Testament great leaders, the great men of faith in the Old Testament. A great number of them are cataloged in the book of Hebrews in chapter 11. Sometimes we call it the great faith chapter, but actually it's the heroes of the faith of antiquity. And so the writer of Hebrews uh, gives a catalog of some of the greatest believers of all time in the Old Testament. And and says basically that they stand to witness to us so that we might likewise in our day become witnesses to the next generation and therefore that we might fulfill this concept of discipling 
and leading. So discipling and teaching are all part of leadership. There's perhaps more to leadership because leadership has administration, a number of other factors that are part of leadership. We're going to study the entire doctrine of leadership as we find it in the scripture in both the Old and New Testament. But I've chosen to start off looking at the Old Testament saints, the great leaders of antiquity. And so we looked at uh, basically an overview of the books of Kings and uh, uh, that's in something I call Leadership Addendum, the books of the kings of Israel. There are six books of kings in the Old Testament, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, and First and Second Chronicles. They were different in the original autograph, but uh, that's what we have them in our Bible today, and so most of us are familiar with them as six separate books although the first two, 1st and 2nd Samuel, are at one time one book. In fact, sometimes even considered 1st uh, and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings as four, uh, uh, as one book complete, 1st, uh, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th Kings. 1st and 2nd Chronicles was separate, but nevertheless, all of these refer to the kings of Israel. Basically, it starts with Saul, then David, then Solomon, and then it goes down two lines in the divided kingdom. It goes through the kings of Judah, which was the southern kingdom, basically the tribe of Judah and Benjamin, and the other 10 tribes, which kept the name Israel, often called Ephraim and by other names, but the northern 10 tribes and those kings. So we have basically a number of kings that we have mentioned in the past, and we see that there are basically 42 kings that are mentioned in the scripture. That includes the southern kingdom, the northern kingdom, and Saul, David, and Solomon. So we're going to take a run through some of those looking primarily at the good kings in the southern kingdom because uh, there were no good kings <laughs> in terms of leadership in the northern kingdom of Israel but there are about eight uh, out of 20 in the southern kingdom and of the first three Saul David and Solomon David was the only one that is that has any recommendation in fact he's the only one that's mentioned uh, in the uh, book of Hebrews in the hall of faith and so it is interesting that he's the only king mentioned out of uh, 42 kings uh, that he's uh, referenced as being a man after God's own heart. Well, we looked at that addendum. You can get this at the website, Leadership Addendum, the Books of the Kings of Israel. We've already gone through and discussed that. And then we started looking through uh, these great leaders of the Bible who live by faith, primarily mentioned in the book of Hebrews. And so we looked at last uh, two weeks, Abel. Uh, and we have uh, Cain and Abel. Abel, of course, had a short life, but he was a righteous man, and he is remembered in the Hall of Faith in Hebrews 11. Then we have Enoch. Uh, there were probably others along the way, but he is singled out as one of the truly great believers in the seventh generation from Adam. We noted the fact that in the book of Jude, he is uh, actually quoted something that's found in the book of First Enoch not part of our biblical canon, but apparently a book that at least some record was before the flood. It's the earliest writing that we have in the entire Bible, and it's in the book of Jude, where he quotes from First Enoch. Uh, some of the rest of First Enoch may be uh, uh, spurless, uh, but uh, uh, nevertheless, that portion is actually in Scripture. So uh, he, of course, was uh, one who was uh, pleasing to God, and he walked with God, only lived 365 years. So it's not the length of years that you live, it's the quality of life. You say, well, boy, if I could live 365 years, that's not bad. Well, you have to remember, they were living eight, 900 years. So he was just a kid at 365. Uh, for us, uh, we're a kid at about 20, and that's about it. After that, it's downhill, you know. <laughs> but uh, uh, for some, for those of us who are going to make it to 365, it's no problem at all. At any rate, uh, he was one of the great ones. We noted him. Then we looked at Noah and Job. Of course, two of the great ones. In fact, Noah and Job are mentioned together as those who are uh, actually some of the great ones of the entire Old Testament. And of course, we have Daniel as being the third one. They're mentioned specifically, as we noted, in Ezekiel 14, 14 through 20. That's mentioned under Job, where it says these three. 
uh, if a nation was uh, dis disobedient to God and it was uh, going down under what the Bible calls the five cycles of discipline and the nation was about to be destroyed, if those three men were in that nation, only they would be delivered. The rest of the nation would not. And so the remnant was cut down to three people. And he mentions this about four times in this Ezekiel 14 passage. So it isn't just the nation uh, that can be destroyed, but all the people within it except the remnant. We have a remnant from uh, Daniel when he went with his three friends and those who went into captivity in Babylon. He managed to make it through 70 years, came out on the other end. We don't know about his three friends, but they became administrators as well. Mm -hmm. So God, under adversity in a nation that is faltering, a nation that goes down and is in the ash heap of history, nevertheless, God will deliver that remnant. You'll remember in Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, those cities uh, that were destroyed by God, there were actually five cities, Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, and Zoar. Zoar apparently wasn't quite as bad as the other because God permitted Lot to go and live in Zoar. He was kind of a city boy, uh, even though it was a small town. The others were destroyed. Uh, they basically blocked up the southern end of the Dead Sea, and it's like that today. So it's not a living sea. It'll be opened in the future, but right now it's not. And so uh, Lot was protected uh, and taken out while the city was destroyed. And there was actually a bidding contest where uh, uh, God was saying, well, uh, you know, uh, Abraham would say, well, what if there's uh, 10 righteous, you know, and he worked it down from uh, from 50 all the way down to 10, I believe it was, and there weren't 10 righteous men. Can you imagine? In all those five cities, there weren't five, 10 righteous people. There was only really Lot and his wife and his two daughters, and the rest all perished. And somebody said, yeah, well, Lot's wife looked back and was turned to a pillar of salt. So I guess we have to say like three and a half. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have 10. We had about three and a half as far as those. And God didn't deliver it. So you try to, you try to think about our nation. How many people do we need to preserve our nation? What does the remnant have to be? Many of us hope that the remnant is large enough, obviously more than three people, but the United States is much bigger than the cities of those five cities of the plains. So... Uh, at any rate, we don't know. All we know is that our job is to be faithful to the Lord and therefore that we will be part of the remnant that will be delivered one way or the other by God, either taken out at the rapture or delivered through the adversity in some way. So we have, uh, uh, this is the case with uh, Noah. He was delivered and his family, eight people. A whole civilization was destroyed. We don't know how many million. I've tried to figure it out using uh, exponential factoring and all sorts of things mathematically. Others have done the same thing. But bottom line is there must have been millions of people on earth and they all drowned in the flood except for eight people. So when we talk about catastrophe and the loss of life, we have never seen a loss of life like occurred uh, before the flood until the second advent <clears throat> when we see... At that future time, about half, <clears throat> pardon me, about half the world's population is going to be destroyed again. So even as bad as things get and the destruction of many people and even thousands of people uh, before the flood, it was even worse. And it's going to be still worse at the second coming when the Lord destroys the armies of the beast. So in the meantime, we have work to do. So Noah was delivered. <clears throat> pardon me. Always happens about five minutes in. <clears throat> okay, so uh, Noah, <clears throat> brother, <clears throat> pardon me. Noah and his family were delivered, and so we noted that, and uh, the flood, of course, in about 2300. And 48 BC, uh, over 2,000 years before. So it's over 4,300 years ago for the flood. Uh, this is from the best chronology, Dr. Floyd Nolan Jones, who's put together a great chronology of the Old Testament. <clears throat> Job, of course, uh, the only one that really isn't mentioned in Hebrews. I'm not sure why. Uh, he was the earliest one, really, that's uh, recorded other than Enoch. And, of course, Job wrote the entire book, or at least someone wrote it in Job's behest. Uh, some of it sounds like it's first-person accounts. So I rather suspect that he wrote that particular work that we call the book of Job. At any rate, his name meant hated or persecuted, uh, even though he was blameless. We looked at the passages there noted again that he was part of the uh, crowd he and uh, Noah 
and Daniel that are recognized as the great ones in Ezekiel 14, 14 through 20. Well, that brings us down to Abraham, where we start tonight. And Abraham is number five on the hit parade here. So we go all the way back to Genesis, and Abraham certainly is one of the great ones. That seems like a great deal of information is written about Abraham. And before Abraham, uh, we have basically uh, everything else from the beginning from Adam. And so all of a sudden it gets to Abraham, and then uh, time slows down in terms of the biblical teaching, and we have quite a bit of information about Abraham, and that sets up a covenant that God makes with this person, who was what we would call a Gentile, who became a Hebrew. And uh, the word Hebrew, many people <clears throat> think that it comes from the Hebrew word avar, which means over or to cross over, that he crossed over from being a Gentile to being a Hebrew. Uh, we think of the word Jew, but that didn't come in until much later from the tribe of Judah. So he became the first Hebrew, and then Isaac and Jacob, and that line became the line of promise through which the Messiah would come. Jesus Christ is of the line of Abraham. And Abraham was promised a covenant, and his line was promised a covenant, and those who blessed Abraham and his descendants would have blessing, and those who cursed Abraham and his descendants would have cursing. And ultimately, not only would Israel have a land of their own in perpetuity in the future, uh, but they would have, of course, multitudes of people, as much as the dust of the earth, as much as the sand of the seashore, as many as the stars in the heaven, can't count them, that many Hebrews in the future. So a people, a nation, a land, and finally a uh, Messiah who would come, one who would be a king to rule over them and in the land of Israel, which would be their future. So that covenant really uh, sets up the entire, really, rest of the Bible, uh, what we call the Abrahamic covenant. So Abraham, and it all started basically <laughs> with him uh, coming from Ur of the Chaldees and heading down through Jerusalem and even down to Egypt, but basically he ended up in Jerusalem and uh, uh, too many things to discuss with regard to uh, all the activities, but eventually he had a child uh, by his wife, Sarah, and this was the one of promise. He had uh, another son before that, um, uh, which, uh, of course, was not the son of promise, but Isaac was the son of promise. So we come in in chapter 22 when God asked a very unusual thing of Abraham, and he says, it came about after these things that God tested or proved Abraham, and he said, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Basically, when God calls you, say, I'm here. Uh, pick up the phone, and he said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will tell you. Now, this just seems impossible. How can God, who has provided him in his old age, at age 100, his wife at 90, to have this child when they were past the childbearing years, and here he has the son that God has promised who will be uh, the line of Messiah, and he's asking him to kill him, basically because the burnt offering was totally consumed. Uh, they would kill the animal, slit its throat, let the blood drain out, and, of course, put it on the altar and consume it with fire totally nothing left it was a total burnt offering can you imagine i mean i can't even put myself into that place and yet abraham because of his faith because of his faith he was willing to do that and the only thing that we can think about is that god was testing him obviously and that he thought in the back of his mind that the promise was that he's going to have this son and he's going to live so he's going to raise him from the dead in fact the writer of Hebrews says as much. We'll take a look at that. That must have been his thought. I'll kill him, but God's going to raise him up. So even Abraham understood the resurrection of the dead. He wasn't the first. Job describes the fact that he will see his Redeemer. Whether he's in the flesh or his flesh is destroyed, he will see his Redeemer. And therefore, Job looked to a second advent, as we call it, to the Lord actually having a resurrection in that future. And this was long before Christ ever came in to the picture. So we see Abraham rose and he did just as he was supposed to do. And of course, uh, he raised his eyes and saw the place at a distance in verse four. And he took, uh, said to the young men, stay here with the donkey and I and the lad will go yonder, verse five, and we will worship and return to you. 
And I like that word return there because it sounds like uh, he's going to go up and kill him and immediately the Lord's going to raise him from the dead. Uh, that's exactly what he believes uh, unless he's lying. And of course, his faith is counted as righteousness, it tells us, in several places. And therefore, obviously, he believed that's exactly what was going to happen, uh, even though I don't think Isaac was privy to this at the time. And I'm sure that uh, uh, he had to ask his father, do we really have to do this? Do you believe in God that much? And so this was a test not only for Abraham, but for Isaac to go through it. He said, no, dad, no way. I'm not going to do that. And he ran back down the mountain. But that's not what happened, as we, of course, know. And he took some wood for the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took his hand, uh, took in his hand the fire and knife. And so the two of them walked up together. And then, of course, uh, uh, he said, my father, in verse 7, and he said, uh, here I am, my son. And he said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Apparently, he figured they were just taking a normal burnt offering, which, would been, which had been apparently explained through all the earlier part of the Old Testament, even before the Mosaic Covenant. At any rate, Abraham said, God will provide for himself a lamb or a ram for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. And it's interesting here, he said, God will provide for himself. And of course, the sacrifice is for God. And he's saying God will provide for his own self, for himself. And of course, this is a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ, even though perhaps Abraham didn't understand that, but uh, it is written that way so that he would provide for himself. God will provide the sacrifice. However, at this point, Abraham's thinking he's going to have to kill Isaac. They came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built the altar, and he arranged the wood, and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. I think about this time Isaac got the picture. It ain't looking good. Now he's seeing that uh, this is this is going to end uh, poorly, at least from his standpoint, although we don't know, we can't read his mind. Perhaps he uh, was explained uh, what's not written here, uh, that uh, that's okay. Uh, God's going to raise you from the dead because he's promised and he is God. And therefore, we're going to go through with this. And he stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son, but the angel of the Lord. We believe this is a three... Uh, a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ, the angel of the Lord, uh, the angel of God. All through the Old Testament, it is the pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. We call it a theophany, theos, theos from God, uh, an appearance uh, from the Lord, and it is the second member of the Trinity before the incarnation, before he came into history as the Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus. And he called from heaven and he said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, I'm here. Here I am. And he said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad. Do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear, that's reverential awe, and that's an understatement, God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him, there was a ram caught in the thicket. Well, you know the rest of the story. And so they offered him up as a burnt offering. In verse 14, it says, Abram called the name of the place the Lord will provide. Uh, and this, of course, many times churches will have a sign or a, a poster or something up uh, overhead. It's a uh, uh, Yira, which is the Lord will provide, Jehovah Yira. Uh, they say Jireh, but it's Yira in the Hebrew. And so the Lord will provide. And that's something we need to remember, that the Lord will provide. We say, what are we going to do now? What, what do I need? Oh, things don't seem well. Think of this, the Jehovah Yira. The Lord will provide. He provided in the most dire situation when it seemed terminal. It seemed like death for Isaac. It seemed like he was losing his only son and yet his faith knowing that God would provide and he surely did. And he said this, uh, as it is said to this day in the mount, the Lord, it will be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven. And of course, this is where he gives the information and part of the Abrahamic covenant that says his descendants will be as the stars of the heaven. Verse 17, indeed, I will greatly bless you and I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies.
enemies, victory in the future. Uh, of course, there's a lot of history that goes before that millennial kingdom, but he's giving him the information of the final victory in the future. And then Abraham's descendants, all the nations of earth shall be blessed because you have what? Here it is, obeyed me. So leadership starts with reverential awe of God, he feared God, and obeying God. Leaders need to have reverence for God, and all leadership that has a reverence of God will begin with decent uh, leadership capabilities, and then to be obedient day by day and moment by moment. Now, that goes for every believer. By the way, we talk about leadership, and we say, well, I don't plan to be a leader. I'm just, you know, I just go to church. I just do my job. All of us are leaders at some time or other. Fathers are leaders of the family. Fathers and mothers are leaders of their children. Uh, the children are leaders of the dog or the cat. Now, you laugh at that, but uh, obviously, teaching children to uh, take care of animals is one of the great ways for them to understand leadership, caring for pets. And so those children who learn to care for pets are learning principles of leadership, caring for those that you have charge of, just as parents with children, coaches with a team, uh, dr drill instructors with the military unit that they are over, and on and on. Everywhere there is an instructor, he, of course, uh, has the ability, hopefully, and the authority to lead. But all of us have leadership opportunities in this life. You may not have them right now, but you see all leaders have to be prepared. And what you are doing in Bible class, what you are learning in the Word of God is a preparation for you to be a discipler, a mentor, a leader. And don't worry, God will use you. One pastor said one time, God uses prepared people. And so you say, well, what am I going to do? When is it going to happen? Your job is to prepare. Your job is to have your nose in the word of God, to be in fellowship, confessing your sins as surely as the Holy Spirit convicts you, stay in fellowship and study the word of God and do those things that you know from the word of God that are pleasing. And the obedience that you have will lead you to the time when you will be used as a leader. Therefore, God uses prepared people. That's what we do in Bible class. Some people say, well, I don't know. I'm, I'm interested in this subject or that subject. Some are interested in prophecy. Some say, well, I have some marital problems. Are you going to talk about that, Pastor? Uh, how do I deal with my children? Listen, you study the Word of God. Wherever you stick your nose in the Word of God, that's what you need at that time. Don't worry about a particular subject. The Word of God has power. It's alive and powerful. It's energizing and enabling you to do whatever you need to do. Think about the fact that God provides for you. So whatever I'm teaching tonight is what God has for you for provision right now. And you don't have to worry about, well, I want to study this. I want to look at that. You study the word of God where you are at that moment. You have other times you can study and read on your own. But right now, this is what you need. You may not think you need it, but you do because you need the word of God whenever it's taught, wherever it's taught by someone who has the gift of pastor teacher. All right, so we have this, and that's basically the story, and we've kind of cut to the chase. There's much more, many chapters dealing with Abraham that we could look at, but I wanted to look at that one in particular in Genesis chapter 22, 11 through 18, which we have just seen, uh, that last verse, the blessing of all nations through Abraham. So the Abrahamic covenant, primarily for Israel, but all nations receive blessing even today on the dispensation of the church that we live in from Pentecost to the rapture. We receive the overflow of the blessing of the Abrahamic covenant. Oh, we don't get the land of Israel. Uh, you know, we don't, uh, uh, we don't get to uh, officiate as far as I can tell in the sacrifices. Although in Ezekiel, it seems that some Gentiles actually get to participate in the sacrificial system. Uh, we looked at some of that in the study in Ezekiel, but uh, basically, uh, we simply get the overflow in the dispensation of the church. Nevertheless, we are blessed by the covenant God made with Abraham. Why? Because he was obedient. He reverenced God. You want to participate and enjoy that blessing from God? Then you need to have a reverential awe and respect for God and be obedient to his word to the best of your understanding. Keep in mind, we have something that Abraham did not have totally, and that is the filling of the Holy Spirit and the permanent indwelling. Abraham had the Spirit of God, but not permanent. 
It was for function and different times that he had the Spirit of God. We see through the Old Testament, there was a concept called endowment, where God would endue certain people with the Holy Spirit for a particular ministry, but they didn't have it permanent. We have a permanent endowment. We call it indwelling, and we have the filling or enabling of the Holy Spirit. So we have uh, divine operating assets that they did not have. We have the enabling of the Holy Spirit and the completed canon of scripture. No excuse, please. We have the text. We have everything we need to fulfill our destiny, to fulfill the uh, obedience to God, and therefore to become leaders. And the greatness of your leadership is determined by your obedience to God and your faithfulness to his word. Okay, enough of that preaching, but that's the idea here. The thing that we remember most, I suppose, about Abraham is that he was called the friend of God. And uh, over in uh, Second Chronicles, chapter 20. Second Chronicles, that's the last of the six kings, books of kings. Second Chronicles, chapter 20, verse 7. Now, basically, we could read the whole chapter, but uh, to expedite, I will not read the entire chapter because we'll come back to this later when we study Je Jehoshaphat. And, Je and Jehoshaphat, whenever I say that, I think of jumping Jehoshaphat, but I don't know that he ever did a lot of jumping, but he was one of the good kings in Israel, and this was one of those times when he did something wonderful. Uh, he was coming under siege and combat from the Moabites. If you look at uh, Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 1, uh, the Moabites and the Ammonites and the Meunites uh, all came against him, and they warred against him. And some came and reported, uh, saying, a great multitude's coming to you you from above the sea out of Syria and behold there are the Hazazar uh, Tamar that is in Gedi and Jehoshaphat was fearful well okay it's okay to have a certain fear but uh, you don't let it control you and dominate you and so what did he do in his fear he turned his attention to seek the Lord I'll stop right there because it says, when you're afraid, are you afraid? We have a lot of people running around fearful, wear a mask, not wear a mask, uh, fearful of the invisible virus that's going to attack and kill everybody in the whole planet, and people are going crazy with fear, and it says here, okay, well, oh, there's your fear. What do you do? Turn your attention to seek the Lord, fear thou not. And he proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. Can you imagine a president saying, we need to have a fast? Because we've got uh, we've got to get ready for this combat. Most people say, "Man, you better buckle up. Better get some food in your belly because it may be a long campaign." He said, "We need to have a fast." <laughs> Does that make sense? Because when people fast, they're not thinking about food. Maybe they are for a while, but it helps you to focus on what's really important. And most of us have fasted at one time or another, <laughs> maybe for a medical, a pre uh, some type of medical uh, uh, operation or something where we had to not eat for a day or two. Always seems terrible. But by, by the time you get to the end of it, you think, well, I'm not even hungry now. I was for a while, but then when you uh, get past that, you get to a place where you can really focus on the Lord, and that was the objective. Uh, sometimes people fast to lose weight, but uh, the mo main reason biblical is so that you can focus not on your stomach and what you need to sustain you, but so that you can focus on the Lord, and so they did. And Judah gathered together to seek help from the Lord, the whole nation the whole southern kingdom. They even came up uh, from the cities of Judah to seek the Lord. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah in Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. And he said, O Lord, the God of our fathers, art thou not the God in the heavens? He knows he is. Art thou not a uh, ruler over all the kingdoms of the nations? Power and might are in thy hand, so that no one can stand against thee. Didst thou not, verse 7, O our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel and give it to the descendants of Abraham? Boy, he calls back to the Abrahamic covenant, and then he says the caveat, the friend forever. God's friend forever. Abraham is God's friend forever. Why is he listed? He's a great leader, great man, great obedience, 
great reverential awe for the Lord. And here Jehoshaphat, one of the great kings of the southern kingdom, the only eight of them, he's one of them. And here it is, come into a combat situation. Oh, there's a certain amount of fear and angst, but he called up for a fast. Everybody came together, the whole nation. And of course, uh, they won the victory and we won't get into that. My point is that he cites Abraham, thy friend. And of course, uh, uh, he continues on. We'll look at that when we get to Jehoshaphat and see the victory that ensued then. At any rate, we have that one and this uh, particular one and all the way through here. In fact, uh, all the way through verse 30, if you want to read it for yourself, <laughs> I don't want to do it right now, but just a, a highlight. Look at uh, verse uh, 21. And he says, and when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those uh, uh, those uh, who sing, uh, who sang to the Lord and those who praised him in holy attire. Notice they dressed out for this. Uh, no uh, T-shirts and flip-flops here. They were dressed up as they went out before the army and said, give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness is everlasting. That, of course, is the uh, great praise that uh, David created, uh, what we call the Ark Psalm. When the Ark was brought in, David coined that phrase, give thanks to the Lord for he is good and his loving kindness is everlasting. And they always said that before they went into combat. And here it is right here in verse 21. And when they began singing and praising, the Lord set ambushes against the sons of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, which is Edom, for those who came against Judah so that they were routed. Well, I've got to go on here, but uh, this is such a great passage. Uh, one more down here, verse 26. Then on the fourth day, they assembled in the valley of Baraka, for there they blessed the Lord. Therefore, they have the name place, the valley of blessing, the valley of Baraka until this day. In fact, there's a church in Houston called Baraka. Uh, some people call it Baraka, but it's Baraka. And it means blessing, the place of blessing, because they had deliverance. Look at verse 30. So the kingdom of Jehoshaphat was at peace, for his God gave him rest on all sides. Why? Faithful, praying to the Lord, asking the people for a fast. Well, I've jumped ahead now. We're looking at one of the great kings. We'll come back to this. But I wanted to cite the fact that he mentions he mentions here Abraham. And then, of course, we have uh, the passage in Isaiah 41. I thought I'd get past uh, Abraham, but uh, it just takes time to go through these. And they're so good. There's so much here. Isaac, I'm sorry, Isaiah 41, 8. Isaiah 41, verse 8. Here he says, but you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, descendants of Abraham, my friend. There it is again. And of course, we have those who would take this passage with regard to uh, election and Calvinism. We won't go there tonight because the choice here is of a people. The kingdom of Israel is in view, not individual people. He chose Israel. He chose here, as he says, Jacob. Of course, Jacob had the, the uh, children, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he had the 12 children uh, that, uh, of course, plus Dinah, and they are going to be the children of Israel. So uh, this is Israel. It is Jacob. It is the descendants of Abraham, my friend. I'm mostly interested here in the fact that Abraham was the friend of God. And so he quotes what we just saw over in the Chronicles. And that's not all. When we go now to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11. We haven't come to it in our study on Sunday. We will, and we'll rehearse some of this again. But in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8, all the way through 19. Again, we won't read it all because of time. But in verse 8, one we find after Noah, verse 7, the next one listed in the hall of faith, these great heroes of the faith, is by faith. Abraham, when he was called, obeyed, uh, by going out to a place which he had, which was to receive, he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. This is when he was called out of Ur of the Chaldees. By faith, he lived in an alien land, a land of promise. Sometimes we think we're in the land of an alien land, but the land is a land of promise if we are in 
Christ Jesus, uh, in a foreign land dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. And he was looking for a city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. That is that new heavenly Jerusalem we've talked about, even taught when we looked at the millennial kingdom. It's going to be our heavenly home, and we get to go there. So when we die or the rapture, we go to be with the Lord in the new Jerusalem in the heaven. It's that heavenly city. So we do go to heaven. And we're going to come back with the Lord uh, to begin the kingdom on earth, but that's our heavenly home. At any rate, uh, that's what it was. Then he goes through uh, Sarah, his wife, who received the ability to uh, bear, and then he talks about the importance of faith uh, and uh, uh, how important faith is and so forth. And then in verse uh, 16, he says, but as it is, they desire a better place, a better country. That is a heavenly one, the new Jerusalem. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. The city in heaven is going to be prepared. Here it's in the past tense, as if it's already done. And yet Jesus said in John 14, I go to prepare a place for you. Here it says it's already prepared. So this is what we call a futuristic perfect. It's a past tense used as a future accomplished fact, looking at the future as if it's already done. Because with God, tomorrow and yesterday are all finished. They're all done in God's mind. He sees the beginning from the end. And then we see the result of that episode here where he talks about by faith, uh, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was offering his only begotten son. Uh, and to him it was said, in Isaac, all your descendants will be called. That's the promise. And again, considering that God is able to raise men even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. And that's all we have. We have the fact that he gives this as a type. That's why we know that Abraham, offering up Isaac, even though God stayed his hand and delivered Isaac, he became a type of Jesus Christ. God the Father gave his only begotten or uniquely appointed son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross. And he didn't stay his hand. He didn't allow him to come down from the cross as he could have. Jesus said he had to drink that cup. And therefore, that was the cup of the wrath of the Father on the sins of the human race in the body and soul of Jesus Christ. So this is a type. So the Abrahamic covenant and everything that we see about Abraham up to and including this passage in Hebrews chapter 11, uh, which continues all the way through here down to uh, verse 19, as we just saw, uh, deals with the blessing that comes to us even today through Jesus Christ. And this episode with Abraham and Isaac was a type. We see a lot of types. It says right here, it was a type, typical of the fact that Christ would die on the cross. Well, that brings us through Abraham. One last one here in James, because we see in James, again, the reference. So in Hebrews, we go to the first book after that, James chapter 2. We've studied the book of James. We're not going to get mired in the uh, passage that people think you have to work for your salvation. It is a demonstration. In fact, the entire book of James has to do with believers and how they demonstrate the faith that they have. And they demonstrate it by production. And here, of course, we have the fact that Abraham was a believer long before he offered up Isaac. Many years, as a matter of fact, when we studied Abraham, we looked at the fact a number of years had transpired since he had believed in the God of uh, creation. And he believed in that God, but it's credited here. And it says the scriptures fulfilled in verse 23. And, as Abraham believed God, and it was counted or reckoned to him, imputed to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. There's this friend of God mentioned one more time. So God felt that Abraham certainly was his friend. Now in this passage, it's slightly different than we found it in the Hebrew. In the Hebrew, it says Abraham believed in God, in the Lord, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Here, it's Abraham believed God. It is slightly different. Uh, it is still a, a possibility to have in, but there's no preposition here in the Greek. 
It has a date of case, which could be, but believe God, he believed that God would deliver his son. And therefore, while he believed in the Lord in the book of Genesis, here he believes God that he will deliver his son. Without going into any more detail, uh, this is, of course, the fact that Abraham was vindicating the fact that he was already saved. And that's what we see here in chapter two. So a lot going on. If you studied with us in James, uh, this makes sense. If not, you may still be a bit uh, mystified, but trust me, we've gone through it. It's actually available at the website if you want to go back. And if you didn't get this, we do have this under Leadership Special Part 1. You can go to the website under uh, is it uh, Special Topics. Oh, it's under Doctrines. Okay, just under L, Leadership. You can pull this up, and uh, we just uh, put an updated version. And so we're going to go through uh, more of these. We're going to pick it up next time with Moses. And Moses is the next one. And so we'll go through these and uh, end up with the kings of Israel. De Abraham was really important. And the other one, of course, that's really important is David. So but, well, Moses is great too. So these are all great leaders. And we could spend probably uh, five, six, seven hours on each one of these. So I'm simply highlighting these, maybe encouraging you to go back and read the rest of the passages that deal with the subject of each one of these individuals. Not too much on Abel. A little more, little on Enoch, a little more on Noah. Job has a whole book over 40 chapters, Abraham quite a bit. And so as we go along, we get more information, more things to discuss. Well, that gives us another start of great leaders. So we're studying the great leaders. But remember, God wants all of us to be leaders in the sense that we not only give the gospel as evangelists, but we are to disciple and teach. Give the gospel and then teach the principles that you know to all who will listen as long as you have breath. Father, we thank you for this opportunity we've had to study your word. We recognize that your word is alive and powerful. It's energizing to our very soul. It's the very fabric of what we need in this life in preparation, not only for the work that you give us in this life, but for the life to come and the rewards that will come with regard to the kingdom in administration and leadership there. Help us to become those who are adequately prepared through the intake of your word. And Father, for that person who's here today, this evening, without Christ, without hope, and without eternal life, we want you to know that in the scriptures, God has told us that Jesus Christ came into human history as God's son, the God-man, and as the Savior. And he lived a perfectly sinless life, qualifying him to go to the cross and there he bore the sins of every member of the human race, past, present, and future, once and for all people, once and for all time. And if you believe in that finished work of Jesus Christ, you have, at that very moment, everlasting life. You can tell the Father, simply, Father, I'm believing in Jesus Christ. Thank you that he died on the cross for me. That's a way of expressing the belief that you have. You can do that right now, right where you sit, in the privacy of your own soul. Won't you do it before you leave? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity once again to travel through your word and to see these marvelous leaders of antiquity. We pray that we might follow in their steps and that we might indeed become the great leaders of our day. Help us to do that, Father, through your spirit and through your word. For we pray these things all in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen.